Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello, and welcome back to Out With Dan. Today, I'm excited to talk to Jacqueline Winsberg, a New York Times bestselling author about her book that is being published today, The White Lady. Welcome, Jacqueline. Hello, and thank you for having me. Oh, uh, I'm... It, thank you. It is. This book is amazing. It is just amazing. I love books that have strong women. Mm -hmm. And the women in this book, you have managed to imbue with such qualities and such grace. There's some really great women and there's some women that are not so great. Did you set out specifically to write a book about strong women? I, that is something that, you know, when we spoke earlier, it comes out quite organically. I'm interested in, I'm interested in strong women, but it's not so much the strong woman. It's the woman who shows strength because oh we are all made up of, you know, our strengths and, and what could be perceived as our weaknesses. And it's only the presence of one that, that makes us understand the other. I can remember someone talking once about courage and saying, no, it's only the potential for cowardice that gives us the word courage, you know. Um, but what I am interested in is um, um, people going through, ordinary people going through extraordinary times and how people can be taken out of their, out of the world that they think they're going to live and be plunged into something else. And um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in people, uh, both men and women, in, in during a time of war. And uh, what I wanted to do with, with this book was take a, a woman from girlhood through to womanhood, through two world wars, in which she's certainly not a passive observer. She's actually been trained in the, in the art of killing. It is, it is something that I, before I read this book, I was thinking about my grandmother who was born in 1907 and who lived through two world wars and uh, depression. And then comes along your book and your main character, Eleanor White, lives in that same time mm -hmm. period. How extraordinary, you know, at this point in life, we're so blessed that we're not in world wars. We have wars, but we are not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with you there, but, but maybe maybe not quite the same yeah. battlefield as yeah. World War One and World War Two. But your character, Eleanor White, is in both of them. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little idea of who Eleanor is? Well, I'll tell you how she came about, and right. we'll take it from there. And, and by the way, you know, um, just to to sort of frame this, I've always been really interested. You know, as I said, in in uh, women's history and the stories of women, particularly women having to endure difficult times, whether it's the depression, whether it's personal difficulties, um, uh, all manner. But but the the generation that really fascinated me was the World War One generation of women in in Britain and indeed the rest of Europe. They were the first generation of women to go to war in huge numbers in modern times. And um, and and during that time of war, particularly in Britain, there was not a field of endeavor left untouched by a woman's hand. But here's how, and I've always, I tell you what, I've always discovering Eleanor, although she didn't have that name when I first came across her. Um, I, I guess piqued my interest in secrecy and people that live in secret. Mm -hmm. When I was three years old, my parents lived um, in a very rural area in Kent, and they lived in what was called a tied cottage, which was actually tied to my mother's job. Um, okay. And that was the way that farming went for centuries, that, that you got a cottage with, you were a farm worker. And my mother was the bookkeeper for four farms under the tenancy of one farmer. And it was a local farm and, and he had his office there. And um, so um, and my dad worked on another farm at the time. And then we would, um, my mum and I would walk down to the farm every day through the woods, you know, because it was right on the edge of this, this massive forest. 
And occasionally we would see this woman walking into town or into the village or just walking. And she sort of fascinated me because my mum was a fairly friendly lady and she would say, good morning. And this woman would sort of mumble and she would pull down collar up. And and then one day I decided to chime in good morning and she responded with a very positive smile and everything. And as we walked up the road, and my mum, with by the way, there was no baby talk in our house. There was a, you know, a story mm-hmm. was a story. You know, mm-hmm. you just had to, you had to, you had to rise to the occasion. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Three years old, Wuthering Heights. You know, we're not going to mess around with Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> and and um, anyway, as we got up the road, we, I can still, I can still see this day. My mum leaned down to me and said, "She's one of those women who parachuted into France during the war," and oh, I said. Yeah what's parachute <laughs> and that's when i think she decided that this was maybe a story for another time um but i never forgot that because it seemed you know there was this weird word parachute attached to this yeah. woman who lived in what was called a grace and favor house on the on, on the, uh, the on the this estate which was a massive area of woodland and um old houses and so on and but then it was referred to as crown land even okay. though it's owned it was owned so it's managed by forestry england and um and the grace and favor home was one so, uh, a home given to someone who has served the crown in some way and often you know you think former ladies in waiting former this former that to live in for the rest of their lives and uh, i never forgot her and then uh, it, you know it didn't it wasn't too many more years before i delving into women's history, and we're talking 12, 13, I really came to understand what it meant that these women, you know, were were resistance operatives. Here's a story. When I was about, I guess, nine or 10, one of my, we had a disused railway line near us. One of my favorite games that no one else really wanted to play was to pretend we were resistance agents. <laughs> we were running <laughs> along the railway line. And if a light aircraft happened to fly over, which occasionally it did being a rural area, I mean, oh, it added to the game, you know, we'd run into the forest and we'd be hiding and have our pretend weapons and so on, living what in what, secret. What, it is, and what a wonderful thing to, you know, to be able to use your imagination. But here is someone who sparked something when you were young, that stayed with you. It was something that was so wonderful. And then you've developed it into a story and a story of a resistance uh, Mm -hmm. fighter. And uh, that's what Eleanor does. She, her mother is approached by Isabel, Mm -hmm. uh, who is a resistance fighter and sort of takes the family in and teaches them to do the things that need to be done. And these were things that really did need to be done because it's not it's not fun and games. It's serious business when it's war. It's, it's serious, very serious business. And you know, I always wanted to, and and, to, to, and I've done this with my series, uh, taking a woman through, you know, two world wars who is not, you know, a killer, a resistance operative, or, or, or and so on. Well, it's not just one woman; it's a, a cast of characters. And, um, and 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 I perhaps not just war, but the events of their day. But I really wanted to to see if I could take this woman through two world wars, from girlhood to womanhood, which mm-hmm. is quite difficult. And and when one of the things that sparked that was a question that I had for myself, and that was to do with my grandfather, who was severely wounded at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. He was shell-shocked, gassed, and he was still removing shrapnel from his legs when he died at the age of 77. Wow. And I can remember thinking, you know, there is a man who was wounded by war. And how did he feel when he saw his sons in uniform in the Second World War? You know, my dad at 18 years old being trained to be an explosives expert, you know, Another son on the on the you know on the beaches of Dunkirk, being waiting to be brought out. How did he feel? And I, I wondered about that. You know how how does it feel to face another war when you've been through one war? Mm-hmm. And I never knew how I was going to do that with a young woman and a, a girl, a, a, a girl. Not mm-hmm. not you know she's she's ten when the war starts, first world war. And it was when I was um, doing some research for uh, my book, A Lesson in Secrets, I 
delved into um, sort of intelligence in wartime, uh, in the First World War, and discovered the huge part that women played. And it was interesting that in Belgium, which was an occupied country, um, men that weren't in the army when the country was occupied um, were rounded up. And basically, we're talking boys on the cusp of manhood mm -hmm. and right up to elderly men. Um, they were taken away and they were either shot or they sent to work camps. So what did that leave mainly? Not exclusively, but mainly it was women and girls. Sure. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, this, uh, the organization La Dame Blanche, which means the white lady, and was um, bankrolled by the British from a base in the Netherlands. And uh, girls and women were engaged in, you know, all manner of resistance activity, including sabotage, um, and uh, intelligence gathering, and indeed, as necessary, killing. And then I knew I had it. I knew I could. I had my girl. And uh, but I but I want. I, I, but she is half half English, half Belgian, and uh, and so she, that's how she becomes involved in La Dame Blanche is because she's stuck in Belgium, and at a very young age, is uh, exposed to killing. And I think one of the things that you do with Eleanor is you give us a fully rounded girl because she is a girl at the beginning of the book. She's a girl. Yeah. And she, she has a mind of her own and she has a mind of her own because of the way she was raised. Yeah. Her parents speak to her. You know, you can see the love with her mom and dad, she and her sister. And you can see that she's someone who already has a mind to express. And she does that all through the book. And it's a nice thing not to see is nice to see a child that's strong already. And then, of course, that is one thing that when you're in the resistance, someone like Isabel who comes along, they can see that strength in a child. And of course, sadly or greatly, it's exploited. It isn't something that it's almost something that has to happen. Because mm -hmm. if you don't participate in your life, life often runs over you. And that's very simple, but it is it must be magnified a million times during a wartime. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that this is it, you know, that uh, her family, her, her mother, they're devastated because they, they know their father, who's joined the Belgian army, is not coming back. No. And they realize they have to do something for the country and for themselves because they have a, a fairly ruthless occupier. And they have to get get on and be part of that. And yes, you know, one of the things is that, um, uh, you know, Eleanor's father has the two daughters, Eleanor and Cecily, and he wanted to, he said, you know, I want to raise daughters with sharp elbows, you know, and, and my little Amazons. And, and, you know, and then you get this conflict between her and her sister, who's more mm -hmm. of a teenager and is driving everybody nuts. <laughs> and or about to, you know, she's in that phase. And, um, um, and they choose to go forward and, uh, they choose to do their, do their bit, as they say in Britain. Um, yeah. As so we, as, well, and as we see the book progress, not only in World War I, but then Eleanor plays a part in World War II. Mm -hmm. And I must say that I was so pleased that she still had her spirit about her. She was not broken. She had a part to play. And I love the fact that she was definitely a natural born leader and mm -hmm. was not afraid to stand up because we all know that even today in 2003, women are often behind men in the world. Whereas Eleanor seem is seen to be behind men. See, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. I appreciate that. Question. Yes. And, or, or men try to keep women down. Mm. Not all men, but some do. But here is someone who is a natural born leader. She's also someone who takes care of business, to put it a nice way. And she stands up to Steve in a lot of ways. As we see through the book, mm. he's a character who is maybe on equal footing as far as mm -hmm. the intelligence community goes. But she's not a wallflower. Mm -hmm. And she has ideas that she runs with. And I really enjoyed seeing that progression and, and seeing the fact that she was not afraid to stand up for what she believed in. She's, she's out of her shoes a bit because she's in um, 
you know, the the, her, her, the milieu that she's in at the moment is 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 sort of post-war London and the world of organised crime, and uh, you know she knows she doesn't know that world, but she knows enough to know that it is a war, a different kind yes. of war, and you know while Eleanor, you know she she does her bit, you know she she didn't want to come back into war work in World War Two. She she had made a life for herself despite the tragedies that had unfolded. And it was a life with a lot of rhythm to it. And I think we all look for life's rhythms and yes. wartime throws that rhythm right out. And, and in fact, that's one of the things that quote unquote, you know, got Britain through the, the war was the fact that people would still get up and go to work the next morning, you know, after a bombing and, uh, and, and saw terrible things on the way um, because that's just what people did. Um, but she, she does have that. She's very resolute, and she knows that she has what she has gone through before, and because of that, she knows she can do it again. It doesn't always make it easy for her. No. It doesn't because she does bear scars, and the scars hurt. And. Uh, um, and and so yeah, that's uh, she. She's with Steve. She's angry with him. She's she has, she's frustrated by him. She's yes. angry with him. But she knows at one point she needs him. Yes, and I liked that anger and that frustration because it it really it was what I would think she would be mm. because you know we find out a lot of things as the book goes along. We find out secrets are a big thing, and secrets are the things that in real life. Uh, harm us a lot. Yes. You know, she, and and she has to come to face with her own fears and where mm -hmm. she has been in her life and where she may go in the future. Mm -hmm. And you give us that, we see that insight and we feel her fear and her frustration, but we also see her strength and her resolution. She's, she's determined. She's very determined to do what she set out to do, which is to help her neighbors along the street. And I can't give away too much of the, <laughs> the story there. But, and she is, she, she's, and we find out well why she has been compelled to do this. Yes. And she is putting her life at risk in doing that. And she is in a world of, about which she knows very little, except she understands killing. She understands deception. And she comes to understand even more about deception and uh, this deception between sort of governments and the deception involved in crime. And, um, you know, that, that sort of ambiguity that, that war, is, war is a crime and, and crime can be a war. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is true. And I, it's one of those things that we see in your book. We see the correlation between the police mm -hmm. and the crime and the intelligence gathering and spies. And, you know, Eleanor is has been a spy her mm -hmm. whole life in yeah. one way or another. Exactly. And we see that that childhood trauma or that childhood experience, how it follows her through life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, once again, she stays so true to her character. And that is something that is so interesting as a reader. Um. You know, that's, that's it's interesting you should observe that because, I mean, that's how I, I wrote it. I, she, she, it's like that she, she knows where her roots are and mm -hmm. she understands in a way, you know, her hypervigilance. And hypervigilance is, is something that, that often goes with people who've, who've been through a traumatic event. It's, uh, you know, you're looking, trying to look round the corner for the next bad thing that's happened, but you can't see around the corner, but you keep mm -hmm. looking at the corner. Yes. And and you know, even in her cottage, when she gets up in the morning, she gets her binoculars out and she looks out of her back garden across to the fields and she looks at the woodland and scans the woodland and sees the farmer, you know, plowing his field and she sees all that's going on. And what is she looking for? She's looking for someone coming for her mm -hmm. because yep. that will never leave her. And it, it goes back to the sense uh, that she has that um, because of what she's been engaged in in the First World War, that fate will come for her, that the piper must be paid. And she feels that very deeply. And we see a person who has 
great morals. She understands that she has done some things in her life that needed mm -hmm. to be done at the time they were done. But you see this, you see this person who isn't a sociopath or you see a person who understands their position in what's mm -hmm. going on in the world. And it still is something that she lives with every day. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was, it was as a reader, you really could champion Eleanor White. I, at least I Absolutely. did. I want her on my team. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things I, I feel is that, that we, uh, when we look back at events, we give finite dates. First mm -hmm. World War, 1914 to 1918. Second World War, depending on which country you were in, 1939 to 1945, or was it 1941 to 46? Or, and then you look back in history and, 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 you know, there was the Great Depression, boom, and they'll give it an, a number. We look at our times now, they'll give it a number. But, you know, that didn't work for my grandfather because he was still removing that shrapnel from his legs in 1966, you know, 50 years after he ran across yes. no man's land. Yes. And so, you know, we, in reality, people live with the traumas that have gone before, the traumas. That, and, and, you know, I, you can see that today. When you walk down a city street and you see a, a, a guy of a certain age in a wheelchair, no legs, and he's a Vietnam vet. And he doesn't, and he could clearly, and I say he because, you know, um, most of the people in actual combat were, were men. And though that nowadays in combat, there are men and women. But yeah, his it's, it, it, war never stopped. Yes. His war never goes away. No. No. And and for the, you know, the, the, the nurses, I can remember years ago reading um, a book called Nam by Mark Baker. And it followed um, a, a series of characters, didn't give you your names, their names, but from boot camp through to deployment through to life afterwards. And there was one woman in it and she, it was after the war and she had two kids and she was in the kitchen. The kids were... I don't know, doing something, playing in the kitchen while she was doing some work. And she heard a helicopter come over. She dropped everything and ran outside. And her kids thought, where's she going? You know, because that had been in her training. You hear a helicopter and you run because it's incoming wounded. And she said, I, I can't hear a helicopter without that. And, and I, so with Eleanor, you know, all that she has done and seen at a horribly impressionable age yes remains with her remains with her right to the end right Abs to the end absolutely Jacqueline this has been so fun <laughs> really this has been so fun the book is called the white lady and I love the cover it is just magnificent isn't it gorgeous yeah it I mean this is. is um Andrew Davidson is the artist craftsman there's a lot of light in my room. There here. we go. And, um, <laughs> and uh, this is a woodcut. I explained that to you earlier. Yes. And uh, uh, the creative director, a, a guy called um, Archie Ferguson, he just pulled it all together. And I, I mean, it's it was it's just so lovely. I mean, I just want to run my hands over it all the time. It, it came out <laughs> just as uh, just as I I hoped it would. Um, yeah. It's Thank you very fantastic. much. Um, I know about this, but will you share your website with uh, the audience? Sure. It's uh, JacquelineWinspear.com. So it's first, and, first name, last name, dot com. And a um, couple of interesting places. There's the, if you hit the link to newsletter and go down, there's my newsletter archive. And in my newsletters, I write about the underpinnings of the books that I've written. I do about four pre-pub publication, four or five newsletters. And uh, for this one, I've written about organized crime in London in 1947. And I've written about the origins of the title and uh, because they, there are several threads there. And uh, one of them is, um, the, I mentioned La Dame Blanche. Uh, the reason the organization was called La, La Dame Blanche, the white lady, there's a white lady in the mythology of almost every country in the world mm -hmm. from you know, Scandinavia, the Africans, you know, Afri through Africa and uh, Asia, Europe. Um, but the, um, a white lady 
in term in mythology was said to have brought down the house the how the house of Hosenhollen, <laughs> Hosenhollen <laughs> dynasty, of which the Kaiser was a descendant. Oh, okay. So the what they were called White Lady to bring down the Germans, bring down the Kaiser's army. So, I love it. Yeah, and I of course we have Eleanor White, who locally was known as that White Lady, you know, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and of course her Belgian name was Dewitt, which means roughly the same thing. It all ties in. Thank yeah. you so much for joining me, Jacqueline. This has been wonderful. You're welcome back anytime you will come back. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me to, to talk to you today. It's very kind of you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Hang on for me just a moment. Will do. Thanks. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out With Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com on Twitter at OutWithDan, and on Instagram and Facebook at GoOutWithDan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out With Dan.